Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambu tassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambu tassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambu tassa bhutang dhammang tangkang namasami So this evening I've been uh, invited to give a Dhamma talk and I'd like to consider it more like a reflection rather than uh, uh, sometimes they call it a sermon but it's not really that because uh, I invite you to really observe uh, you know how what I say how it affects you you know so that you're uh, not just uh, thinking or being a, uh, just a listener to me, but also being aware of how what I say, the sound of my voice or whatever, how it, how it affects you emotionally. So this is uh, a way of, of an attitude that I try to, to encourage in people an attitude that I found most beneficial uh, in my life because uh, we're so attached to the thinking mind and tend to analyze things and uh, react to different words, tones of voice, uh, uh, various opinions uh, and then we disagree or disagree with them accordingly uh, where we get confused or whatever. So, uh, in the kind of essence of Buddha's teaching is this word mindfulness. In the Pali, it's uh, sati and tampatanya, the ability that we have as human beings to be aware of what's happening, to observe the, our own bodies and feelings and thoughts and reactions to the conditions we're experiencing in the present. Now this is a, a special day, devote a memorial remembrance day of uh, one of the great uh, contemporary Buddhist monks in Thailand, Tanajan Cha. And of course this was uh, how he encouraged me when I encountered him uh, 40, nearly 44 years ago in Thailand. And uh, he was, his way of training us was to uh, encourage us to really look and observe, you know, our emotions, whatever they might be, positive, negative, confused, uh, good, bad, right, wrong ones, and to be the observer or the knower, because as conscious entities, you know, each one of us, a human individual uh, that's conscious, is uh, is a conscious entity in this vast universe that that is mysterious and rather formidable, because uh, it seems so endless and vast and. Where, where does the universe really end? Uh, there's so many possibilities of pleasure, pain, success and failure uh, in our lifetimes in terms of just uh, planetary movements, changes, natural catastrophes, then the inevitable aging process of our human bodies. The fact that, that we are sensitive beings, we have to live in this state of unrelenting, unmitigated sensitivity from the time we're born to the time we die. And the realm we're living in is a sense realm, so planet Earth, uh, its uh, environment, uh, the, the, the bodies we have, the senses that are, uh, you know, that we, 
that register the, the pleasurable, painful, the beautiful, the ugly, the desirable, the undesirable qualities that inevitably impinge on us as individuals in our lifetime. It's kind of an ongoing experience of irritation. So this is just to, to set down a kind of reflective way of looking at the human condition. It is a strange, we are strange creatures in this vast universe. Are we all alone on planet Earth or are there other human-like creatures on other planets? This is, of course, a mystery. We're always looking for, you know, aliens from outer space or wondering what is beyond, you know, and, and beyond our system, our universal system. And, and, of course, the imagination can only take you so far when you have to give up because it is endless, it's infinite. And from this position of this rather delicate and vulnerable human form that we have, uh, we can't know that much. And so the Buddha, in, in his compassion, established a teaching uh, in a way that, that we can learn ultimate reality, recognize, and free ourselves from delusion through observing, through witnessing, through being mindful of our condition as we're living our life within the limitations that we find ourselves as ind human individuals. Now modern uh, civilization, modern culture is, is based on the idea of progress and material development and evolution and uh, so that modern science as it tends to be uh, taught in most places is based very much on the empirical of looking outward, uh, trying to figure out everything external. Or, you know, we've developed telescopes to look at things far away or microscopes to look at minutiae of things we can't see with our own eyes. But it's always the tendency uh, to look away, to go outward into the universe, into the material world that we're experiencing. And the Buddha, of course, establishing his uh, kind of, his teaching on mindfulness, now this word, English word, is not really all that good a word actually, but it'll do as a kind of translation of Sati Sampachanya. But its ability to reach the very center of pure consciousness before we create anything into it. If we are truly mindful and cultivate and develop mindfulness in our lives, then we're actually going to the very center to pure conscious awareness before we become a personality or anything at all. And so this is, um, and of course the Buddha means, the actual word Buddha means awakened consciousness. So the historical Buddha, Gautama the Buddha, was a human individual in the universe the same as, as you and I, no difference. Uh, but he, in, uh, in his lifetime, was able to uh, relinquish the, the cultural delusions, the conditioning of his mind in order to recognize pure unadulterated consciousness with awareness and from this of course wisdom manifests ability to discern and realize Dhamma the reality of Dhamma so this word Dhamma is a very significant word uh, and it, it, it you know and to translate it it doesn't have a, a really proper equivalent in, in English so we, we take the word itself into the English context because it includes everything and no thing. 
you know it's beyond you know you have you have the conditions and then the unconditioned you have the the uh, sankharas and the grasping of sankharas but there's also awareness of sankharas like sankharas are conditions things that arise and cease can be observed whether it's mental emotional physical through sight sound smell taste touch or thought all conditions are impermanent so this is the way of investigating and observing the nature of all conditions and that which is aware of conditions that awareness takes us to what they call a matadhamma awakened conscious awakening to reality and uh, so this word amatta means a deathless reality amatta dhamma it's a very uh, <clears throat> clear and and I think very brilliant formulation in language the Buddhist teaching as as we encountered in the Pali scriptures and the suttas uh, I've um, used the mainly in in my monastic life just the the first sermon the Dhamma Jakapavatana Sutta the Four Noble Truths uh, because I found this is uh, what I would consider uh, a perfect teaching. It has everything in it you need to know. It's just a matter of putting it into practice because it's not, it's not for grasping as some kind of Buddhist uh, doctrine, but it's a, a tool the Buddha gave us to use to uh, let go and free ourselves from delusion. Now, like all of us, when we're born, when a baby is born, it's a separate, it begins its life as a separate human form that's conscious. And so it, it has the human karma, the body uh, that was born and that will die, and it's a conscious form. And it has the karma of the human condition it has you know instinctual intelligence survival mechanisms and so forth uh, but then as we grow up as we develop we're conditioned through uh, through our cultural conditioning social conditioning the messages the attitudes the language we acquire from our our family the uh, values of our particular family our social status a religion, whatever it might be. And this is the conditioning process that, uh, <clears throat> that, we, that tends to blind us to ultimate truth, to Dhamma, because the conditioning process is, uh, tends to be what we cling to as we grow up, we, we we develop a strong sense of our separateness, our individuality, personality, identity with our human form, you know, what we look like, the gender of the body, it's uh, color of the skin, size of the nose, and uh, all this become what we uh, identify with, and then we compare it with other models. So we have this sense of, you know, trying to uh, see ourselves in comparison through comparing our appearance with somebody else's or some ideal of physical beauty or an ideal form. We also have the ability to create ideals in our minds, you know, of how things should be uh, the best with words, with language we can imagine the best uh, of the conditioned realm, how everything should be. And, uh, and then we tend to uh, compare everything with the ideals that we have created or that we have taken on from our cultural conditioning. <clears throat> so we have, when we grow up, then we, we start suffering because we're basically bound to illusions. Uh, just conditions created by 
unenlightened human beings uh, and those conditions of course uh, have different qualities of good, bad, right, wrong, true and false but whatever they are they're, they're never satisfying conditioned phenomena can never it always leaves us in a state of dissatisfaction disappointment or uh, feeling something, we're missing something something is lacking in our lives and this, you know, the reason why we try to have wealth and security but even at, at life it is very best with all the possible wealth, security, social position the problem is still there because the problem itself is the, is the blind conditioning attachment to the conditions that human beings tend to uh, be obstructed with, blinded by and therefore that's why we have always conflicts, wars uh, problems, personal relationships and uh, it's a, ad infinitum the, the variations and uh, problems that arise on the condition level for all of us, you know, every, whatever culture, society, or whether you're in it, you know, we all have our own forms of feeling dissatisfied or ill at ease or anxious about the future we regard time as our reality and so we time is, is what we truly believe is real and yet time is another condition we, we uh, consider our lives in terms of the length the age of the physical bodies we have and, and its appearance and then its conditioning and then of course it, it grows up and gets old it suffers the aging process, various illnesses and then it dies and so there's always this sense of pathos uh, life on the human realm is always associated with a kind of sadness because our life uh, uh, it always ends in death and uh, in monastic life we always every day in a Buddhist monastery we reflect on uh, this, this reflection all that is mine, beloved and pleasing will become otherwise, will become separated from me and of course this is some people might consider this rather a depressing thing to think about but it is the way it is, it's pointing to uh, you know what every human individual has to bear with uh, uh, at the end of their lives as separation loss and so the Buddhist meditation is a way of, of awakening to the real to the ultimate reality to Dhamma to truth before we die so Lung Po Cha was one of his uh, phrases was die before you die and so this could <laughs> and of course if you try to interpret that from a mind that is not very reflective it doesn't make much sense but in terms of Dhamma reflection you know the death is the always the changing conditions you know we're dying all the time really in various ways and seeking rebirth through our, our uh, just being blind and wanting things and not wanting things but we don't notice it you know, and we, we strongly associate ourselves with the age of our physical body so during this time between birth and death is this potential possibility for enlightenment for seeing clearly uh, the Dhamma or the truth or I like to put it in English was awake to, awake to the real because you know in, in, uh, in like in England for example sometimes we look like Buddhist monks we look like uh, uh, to the uh, English layman like um, like I so say you're not living in the real world uh, it's because we live in a monastery and it's not the same world that most people have you know to bear with in their busy lives in London and so forth so 
They say, you, you don't have to face the real world. So this is, I thought, what is the real world then? <clears throat> and are they living in the real world? Or what, what do we mean, you know? So the real world for most people is their lives, their, uh, how much money they make, their families, their social position, uh, paying off their debts, their mortgages, and buying the, a new car and so forth, the real, real world. Or is the real world not any of that, but uh, this awareness awakened not to a world, but to reality. And so reality then is seen in terms of discerning the difference between conditions and the unconditioned. Be able to, to observe and discern, which is not a, an analytical ability, but an intuitive sense of attentiveness and which you're letting go of the conditioning that you've acquired in order to observe conditioning as it really is, as an impermanent, as a Nietzsche, as a Nata, you begin to see that whatever you think you are, uh, good or bad, right or wrong, that's not what you are. And uh, so that this is to be observed that what we are, we don't need to know what we really are, just what we are not. And so in Buddhist meditation, like especially in the insight practices of Vipassana, this is a, these are skillful means in the scriptural teachings to, to uh, see, to observe the way things are in order to let go of our blind attachments to birth and death or conditioned phenomena that is in this process of change from arising, ceasing, beginning and ending. So in, I, I spent uh, 10 years in Thailand with, uh, and tried to live uh, as close to Ajahn Chah as I could because he'd send me off sometimes to various branch monasteries <clears throat> because he was obviously a very wise human being. And uh, right from the start when I first met him I was quite impressed and uh, even though we did have, you know, we didn't have a common language to converse with, there's something, as they call it, intuition or a sense beyond the sense, something in one kind of recognizes uh, uh, something that at the time maybe I didn't quite know what I was recognizing, but it kind of felt sense that this is uh, someone to trust, someone uh, who I would like to uh, lived near. So I, I spent 10 years, uh, you know, either in his monastery or at various branches. And then uh, he had me sent over abroad after 10 years off to uh, England. It's always been uh, a kind of you know, a, a kind of inspiration to see, uh, you know, to meet an enlightened being or meet a, a wise human being in one's life. And uh, because I never really, I remember when I was uh, entering university, I entered university in 1951. I just was turned 17 years old, very naive. And I had such uh, admiration for all the lecturers, professors, and people that had the, all this uh, learning. And so, you know, I was, uh, you know, hoping to acquire some kind of wisdom and knowledge through uh, being a university student, through the, the supposedly superior creatures. Uh, and, of course, did not, didn't take too long to see that Wisdom was not really a part of the university system that I encountered. And, uh, you know, people might have acquired a lot of knowledge about various subjects in science, arts, history, language, and so forth. But 
it was an acquired knowledge, you know, something you got from outside yourself, from reading books, from listening to others. So then, then my interest in meditation began when I, you know, kind of lost uh, interest in that kind of learning and realized that, that uh, one needed to learn in a different way. And of course, the teaching of the Buddha is, isn't about acquiring all kinds of knowledge about Buddhism, but in actually uh, letting go, seeing uh, the, the, the result of attaching to knowledge that you acquire, uh, opinions that you've acquired or created in your mind, or your own cultural conditioning, blindly assuming and operating from the very biases, prejudices, attitudes of the conditioning process uh, and the ego, the sense of, of a self as a separate entity in relationship to everything else. 